thank you so much for coming. Uh, to our pop-up conversation this afternoon. I'm Anna Palmer. I'm the CEO and one of the founders of Punchbowl News. Um, very excited to be speaking in a, with a Republican and a Democrat, bringing people together. Uh, Representatives Mike Gallagher and Raja Krishnamoorthy are gonna be joining me on stage for a conversation about news of the day, as well as looking and thinking about how do we modernize the national supply chain? A lot to get into there. Um, a big thank you first to Exeter for making this conversation happen. Representative Gallagher, the Republican from Wisconsin, and Representative Christian Morthy, the Democrat from Illinois, are members of the House China Select Committee. Uh, afterwards, our conversation, I'm going to be joined on stage by Rai Barkot, co-founder and CEO of With Honor, and Carrie Wibben, president of Exeter Government Solutions for a Fireside Chat. As always, we encourage you to sign up for our free morning newsletter at punchable.news. If you enjoy conversations like this, we do a ton of events. Uh, you can go to our events hub and look at what we have coming up for the rest of the month. We are on social media at Punchbowl News. Please share this conversation. And with that, we're going to get started. Representative Gallagher and Christian Morthy, welcome to the stage. All right. Thank you both so much. It's been a busy day for you. You had a hearing this morning. Um, we are going to get started with a few news of the day questions. And first, I want to tee that up. This hearing this morning on the Biden administration's China policy. What did you learn or what didn't you learn? Because oftentimes what people say is just as interesting as what people don't say. Representative Gallagher, we'll start with you. Well, one one thing that I, well, first of all, it's great to be here. Thank you. Thanks to Punchbowl. I'm always astounded. I don't mean this as a knock on my staff. I think it's true of most uh, staffs on the Hill. Taylor, my chief, knows where I'm going with this. <laughs> there are a lot of times when I'll ask what's uh, what's happening on the floor or when are we going to vote? What are we voting on? And my staff will say, let me check uh, Jake Sherman's Twitter to figure out what's going on. I'm like, you work on the Hill. <laughs> Why are you asking Punchbowl? Uh, we like that. That's, yeah. that's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, one, one thing that I, I think was underexplored that I'm, I'm really interested in figuring out is we, we seem to have this like increasing semantic distinction between and it gets to supply chain, um, de-risking versus decoupling versus diversifying. And Richie Torres actually asked a question that we didn't have time to, that the administration didn't have time to answer. And I think it's important to understand the difference. There's actually been some recent work by um, econo uh, economists like Muhammad al Arian to suggest that it's a fantasy to think you can de-risk without decoupling in some areas. And I think it's important as an intellectual and practical matter to understand what we're talking about if a core pillar of the Biden administration strategy is to de-risk so we know can reduce the economic leverage that China has over us. We need to understand what that means because just a few months ago we were talking about strategic or selective decoupling, and there seems to be a move away from that. So I still think there's a little bit of uh, muddled or muddied thinking around that aspect. And as I've said repeatedly to the point where Raj is tired of hearing of it, if you sort of conceive of our grand strategy vis-a-vis -vis China as having three major lines of effort, one is military, one is ideological, and the third is what I call economic statecraft, that third one, in my opinion, is by far the most complex and hardest. It's the reason we actually held the debate with Nazak. She was part of it yesterday. We had the first ever Thunderdome debate uh, that the committee hosted. We had two people, uh, two teams of two people debating um, economic engagement versus selective decoupling broadly. Um, and I'm not sure we got a, uh, this morning, in this morning's hearing, a sufficient answer on that question. That makes sense. Sir. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you to Punchbowl. Thank you, Mike, uh, for your leadership of the committee. Um, I had to say that. Uh, <laughs> but um, but uh, in all seriousness, I think what I got out of, this, out of this hearing was there's a sense of urgency on the part of the Biden administration for various reasons to try to do whatever we can to, for instance, prevent aggression materializing into conflict. Um, you know, the CCP is engaging in military aggression against its neighbors, whether it's in the South China Sea, whether it's Taiwan, whether it's India. And, um, you know, that could, you know, spark a, a wider conflict. And, you know, it would be a bad day for the world uh, for, uh, for there to be a war. In fact, um, I quoted a, um, a poll of Americans saying that something like 
52% of Americans view China as a competitor, and 6% view them as a partner. But then um, the flip side of this is that uh, something like 71% of Americans are concerned about a war in the next five years. And so in light of this, I think um, what I took away from today is we've got to do everything we can to deter aggression, prevent um, something from happening that could uh, hurt us in an irreversible fashion. And so uh, we can get into it more, but this supply chain issue is part of the discussion. Um, but today we also focused on the military and security dimensions as well. We're going to talk about kind of the national security risks uh, and imperative when it comes to national uh, the national supply chain, but I do want to ask, we talk about ideological as well as security risk, TikTok has been one of the big issues on Capitol Hill, whether or not it should be banned, should it be Congress who's taking action, should it be the administration? Do you think Congress will take action this year to pass something? I never make predictions about the future. Uh... And also, by the way, Raja also quoted Barbie in this morning's hearing, a very to great effect. Yeah. Got a lot of hot pink here, so you yeah. know we're we're <laughs> really on message. Like, I am a Barbie girl in a Barbie world, exactly. right? Yeah. Um, uh, the honest answer is I don't know. It seemed like we had a lot of momentum behind this issue. Um, my view, uh, dare I say, our view, because we have a bill on this, is that there should either be a forced sale or a ban. Um, that a mitigation agreement um, would be filled with loopholes. I think Project Texas um, is not is not the answer. Uh, uh, so I I thought every we were kind of moving forward aggressively towards that outcome. Obviously, right now, it's slowed a little bit, I think, as a function of two things, to be completely candid. The first is just you're just as you punch ball knows better than anybody, the persistent inner committee tug of war that goes on in Congress and committee chairs jealously guard their jurisdiction. And for something like TikTok, which transcends a few different committee jurisdictions, um, that makes it difficult to get agreement on anything. The second thing is the aggressive lobbying campaign that TikTok has uh, embarked upon, um, hiring a ton of people uh, to spread pro TikTok uh, messages. So I, that not being said, I, I still am cautiously optimistic. We're, we're working behind the scenes to see if we can arrive at a, a compromise uh, language that will avoid some of the pitfalls uh, of the Senate's approach, which a lot of people on my side felt was was too broad with the Restrict Act, but still does what we want to do, which is ban or force a sale. I will say this is bound up in a bigger issue, which is cross-border data flows and the complete lack of regulation for that. It's really the Wild West out there. This is a new thing Congress is dealing with. So you should expect some friction and inertia in our attempts to arrive at the appropriate regulatory balance. For me, the bottom line is, giving everything we know about TikTok's basic ownership structure. Uh, we can't allow a company that's owned by ByteDance, which is effectively controlled by the CCP, to become the dominant media platform uh, in America. Uh, it just makes absolutely no sense from a national security perspective. So my hope is that we can, in this Congress, in the 118th Congress, arrive at a bipartisan outcome that either forces a sale or, or bans it. I think I was just going to jump in and say I, I agree with what Mike said. Just to give you a little background on why this is kind of a little bit of a, a complicated issue, there's something called CFIUS, which I'm sure most of the people in this room are familiar with. And CFIUS is, I, in my opinion, I think it's a little bit of a broken process, honestly. Um, but that's a separate discussion. But essentially, what's going on is that CFIUS is kind of stalemated. It's like deadlocked. It's not really able to process this particular question in a way that is um, consistent with its past practices. And, and so it needs new authorities. The, the administration needs new authorities to be able to do what they need to do in CFIUS. And so they are also asking us for legislation. So the interesting thing is that Republicans and Democrats, both in the House and the Senate, and uh, of course the Biden administration, are all trying to get something done because we all recognize that you know, this is a this is a issue that would probably recur in the future, and we should probably deal with it now in the context of TikTok because it's um you know so such a ubiquitous platform. All right, we're going to get to the topic of the day: supply chains. I think what was interesting when we were talking about this event, 
the pandemic really put into focus, right? For every American, you know, whether they were trying to buy goods or not, the issue of supply chain, the dependence on China, you all have a very unique vantage point given uh, the committee that you're on and kind of the, the work you're doing around China. Can you talk a little bit about the U.S. reliance on China when it comes to supply chains and whether that continues to be a concern? And how do you rebalance that if, if you do think it is a concern? Maybe we'll start with you. It's a huge concern. Um, you know, if you think about some of the technologies of the future, for instance, EVs, EV batteries, if you think about solar panels, if you think about um, rare earths, critical minerals, um, and other items, even personal protective equipment and act active pharmaceutical ingredients, if you think about all of those, China has an um, incredible concentration of either production of those uh, materials uh, manufacture of those materials, assembly of the materials, refining of the materials, and so they have a chokehold. And um, in some cases, they are exercising that coercion. Uh, most recently, you saw that they put uh, in place controls on the export of uh, gallium and germanium, which I've only recently come to study. <laughs> uh, but one of the most interesting things is uh, they apparently produce the world's, um, the majority of the world's uh, uh, quantities of these particular substances, but because they've put in place these export controls, they've also created a st strong demand signal in other countries, including places like Germany, where they're able to now produce gallium, which they weren't interested in doing before because China kind of had the lock. So it's kind of an interesting situation where they... Um, they have these chokeholds, but the moment that they exert economic coercion with those chokeholds, other producers start to pop up, and then those Chinese producers lose business. But more generally or long term, we've got to figure out a way um, to probably, you know, I know Mike uh, re referred to de-risking as p potentially a form of decoupling, but I, I look at it a little differently because I think I think the new word is diversifying, Mike. Uh, diversifying. Hard to keep track. Yeah, it's a D word. You got D, you know. Um, <laughs> definitely so a D word. Definitely a D word. Uh, so, you know, diversifying to me also means having insurance, having an insurance supply, right? Having other redundant places where you can source uh, these materials so that you're not solely re reliant on China. And so I'm seeing that happen more and more in the private sector, even without the government doing a thing. But in some places, we don't have the know-how to be able to replicate those supply chains in the United States. And so that's where the incentives really matter to onshore not only the production, but the know-how. And that's what's happening with the CHIPS and Science Act. It's happening with the Inflation Reduction Act with regard to EVs and um, uh, solar panels and so forth. Mr. Geller, I, I want to ask you, we're, I, I feel like we, we, with two of you on stage, we got a lot of things we're going to get through, so I might jump in a little bit. But I want to ask you about the national security threat that you see as we have rising tensions with China. You've talked about kind of the need to, I think, agree with the idea that we need to look beyond China for some of the supply chain issues that we're having. Put that into focus for us. Wait, but I'm just now realizing the pink is punch. Is that it? Wow. That's the joke. That's wow. The joke. <laughs> That's great. I'm, That's very I'm glad clever. you're here with us. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. I don't really have social media on my phone, so I don't know. I don't know things. I'm like the least cool young member of Congress ever. Uh, no, I forgot your question, dude. So, the national security threat. What is it? Why? Watch. Can I, quick comment on the supply chain thing, really quick. Uh, I, I totally agree. The pandemic was this massive wake-up call uh, for everybody. The moment I always remember and I always come back to is when certain CCP officials threatened to cut off the export of uh, advanced pharmaceutical ingredients to plunge us into a sea of coronavirus. Was a phrase that they used, and that's. I mean, and then you start to sort of think about that, which is something we rarely account for that scenario when we conduct war games, which tend to be focused on strategic and conventional deterrence. Nobody ever thinking about, okay, what have they actually decided to cut off APIs? And a bunch of Americans were left without access to life-saving drugs. Imagine what, what that would do to our ability to sustain support for the defense of Taiwan. I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely uh, critical that we reduce uh, our dependency in certain key areas. I guess we can argue about what those areas are, but I think Raj actually identified some that everyone would agree on. Obviously, we're, we're right now experimenting with the onshoring of microelectronics. I'm probably more skeptical than, than Raj that it's gonna work for a variety of reasons, but 
APIs, we need to figure that out. Um, critical minerals and rare earth minerals, particularly the processing thereof, uh, but also the ability to mine those here uh, in America. And then um, things like the energetics that go into our weapon systems, which we've discovered in many cases are either single source domestically or foreign source to China. We're talking about the explosives, propellants, and pyrotechnics, the things we need to win a war with China. In some cases, we depend on China for those things. Or the Chinese have actually stolen technology that we developed here, ironically, at China Lake in California. China Lake 20 is what it's called, CL20. And now we're using that to have a, a, bit, uh, a greater destructive capacity and range for their rockets and missiles that they're going to use to sink Americans. So figuring that out is essential. At a minimum, for things that fall below that line, I think it's, it's critical to have companies like Exiger that can allow companies to at least understand their supply chain and where the risks are and the choke points are so you could at least accurately assess the risk and you aren't dealing with it in the midst of a crisis. Having that knowledge prior to a pandemic or a war is essential. Um, national security, what's the threat? What's the risk? If I'm interpreting the question correctly, just the national security threat the CCP poses? Yeah. Uh, well, I think the, the near-term threat is war, right? I think we should take Xi Jinping seriously when he says he wants to take Taiwan by force if necessary. He keeps repeatedly saying this, and yet we have a tendency to mirror image and, and discount the likelihood in the West because we think that nobody could possibly do something that risky or stupid, but we now have a big example of what happens when we mirror image and we discount what dictators tell you in plain language. It's called Ukraine. And so our task is to prevent that from happening, to prevent Taiwan's future from becoming Ukraine's present. And I think the risk of war increasing. My whole theory of the case is that if the economic and demographic challenges in China are getting most severe in the 2030s, notwithstanding what's happening in Eastern Europe and the failures she is witnessing uh, Putin undergo, it can make she much more risk acceptant in this decade. And this decade is also where we have significant challenges. We have huge military bills that are coming due. We have an increasingly acrimonious and polarized political system. And oh, by the way, we have a crazy presidential election that's about to kick off. So all those things in my mind conspire to increase the risk of war in the near term. And that's what I'm most concerned about. And that to me is sort of the hardest national security case, but there are others I've already gone on too long. Have a nice day. Yeah. <laughs> really, get your cookie on the way out. Enjoy the prospect of yeah. thermonuclear Those cookies war. look good. I don't know what the square cookie is, but anyway. Probably made in China. <laughs> made in China. <laughs> All right, I want to shift gears the a cookie, little. You, what's the cookie supply chain? Do you, can you guys figure that out? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exit your exit your on it. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit. Uh, we've talked a lot about China, the national security threat, the need to modernize and not be as dependent uh, on China when it comes to national supply chains. But can you talk a little bit? You all are coming at this from the congressional government vantage point. How do you engage? I mean, this can't just be a Congress thing, right? This has to be a private sector thing as mm -hmm. well. What role do you think they have? What are you looking to the private sector to do that maybe Congress can't do? Oh, quickly, I, I sort of have three principles in mind, or, or three things that I, I hope that we can reach an agreement with the private sector on. The first, when we when we talk about strategic decoupling or de-risking or diversifying or whatever the next D word is going to be. Um, one is that I, I don't think we should be funding our own destruction. I, I don't think American asset managers, both passive and active, should be allowed to invest in Chinese technology companies or defense-adjacent uh, companies that are building things designed to kill Americans in a future conflict or designed to perfect a genocidal totalitarian surveillance state that could be exported beyond the borders of China. That's principle one. Again, easy to say the principle, harder to do in practice, admittedly, I'll admit that, uh, but the principle stands. The second would be just to um, uh, accurately assess the risks of doing business in China and take off the golden blind blindfolds and assess the risks. And the risks range from the risk of having your assets seized uh, in the event of a conflict with Taiwan to the systemic financial risk that things like VIE securities uh, uh, pose because they don't have shareholder protections. And then finally, in certain key areas to foot stomp the discussion we just had, I do think we're going to have to take steps, a mix of carrots and sticks, to reclaim our economic independence from China. And there we need the private sector to step up and proactively diversify their uh, supply chain. And again, I understand that I can't just like fly a bunch of helicopters to Southeast China and like pick up all the Foxconn plants and put them in Vietnam and India, and therefore we can have iPhones that aren't made in China. I get it. It's going to take some time, but that work needs to begin now. You know, I think that um, one of the things that I think that the private sector is going to have to do is I think we're going to have to collaborate. <laughs> we're probably going to have to collaborate with each other even uh, among competitors, potentially, to try to understand, you know, where are some of our, um, you know, sourcing issues collectively. And then we're going to probably have to collaborate between countries. That's something that doesn't happen enough, honestly, and it doesn't happen enough uh, for various reasons. But now we're going to have to probably 
um, you know, talk to our friends um, and, and, and partners and allies and others and basically say, look, we all know that economic coercion is happening. You know why? Because they're playing us off each, against each other. Okay. You know, one of the interesting things is that Airbus and Boeing entered into an agreement uh, where they both agreed that going forward, we are not going to um, give away our secrets to building our airplanes when we make factories or when we establish factories in China. Well, that agreement lasted all of like 10 seconds because the Chinese like offered yet another set of um, incentives and then Macron decided, you know, <laughs> Macron was being Macron, let me just say that. And so then Airbus uh, established a second production facility in China recently and you know, you know that there was forced technology transfer associated with that again. And when that happens, you know, what, you know, what, what really happens is that they are basically giving away the secrets the Chinese are going to stand up a competitor. They're going to drive out that uh, company, Airbus in this case, and Boeing uh, eventually. And then that will then become the global competitor everywhere else. That's how they operate in China. At least that's how Xi Jinping operates right now with the CCP. And so you have to be, I mean, we're going to have to enter into agreements. We're going to have to come together as coalitions in industry and then among countries to deal with some of these issues. All right, we are quickly running out of time, but I wanna to get to two more points before uh, they give the hook on this conversation. First of all, let's talk technology, right? We've, we've established what the problem is. We've talked about kind of how the government can work potentially with the private sector, how that might be fruitful. But AI is like the topic du jour, certainly in Washington uh, in terms of its possibilities, but also in the terms of potentially needing to regulate what role do you think AI could have to help solve some of the challenges that you've discussed? And uh, you know, are, what's the role of Congress in terms of actually regulating on it? Well, I do. We had a fascinating hearing on the. I chair the subcommittee on innovation um, on the Armed Services Committee. We had an AI hearing earlier this week, uh, and one of the big takeaways from it, we had the CEO of Scale AI, Alex Wang, and, and a few other experts, Klon Kitchens, and others. Um, it was a great conversation. Um, is that the Pentagon has such a unique opportunity, as Ms. Ellen Lord knows better than anyone else right now, to lead in this area. Because you think about the Pentagon is like a massive emitter of data, like terabytes and terabytes every single day. But the Pentagon doesn't treat data like it treats ammo. And if the Pentagon had a better system for capturing the data, analyzing it, and then leveraging commercial AI to analyze the data and utilize the data, it would give us such a massive advantage, not only in terms of the pure military competition with China, but also in terms of our ability to find massive savings within the Pentagon budget. Oh, and also to interrogate the Pentagon supply chain. Because for years we've been trying to do things like sector by sector, tier by tier analysis. And what we discovered is that like the Pentagon planners, God bless them, using Excel spreadsheets can't even go like two layers deep on their supply chain before their analysis completely implodes. So I actually think we have an opportunity to change the way the Pentagon does business and leverage AI. Part of the problems, however, is we haven't had a big pathfinding project for AI in the Pentagon since Project Maven in 2017, like a grand challenge that's bound up in the bigger problem the Pentagon has with awarding contracts, as well as just the overall acquisition workforce being bloated, ossified, antiquated. I'm running out of adjectives. All A words now. A, a words, D words, let's go. Uh, <laughs> It's 175,000 people. It's like almost the size of the Marine Corps. It's crazy. So there I think we have a big opportunity. A couple other points just on, on AI. Uh, again, I think this gets to the issue. I don't think we want to be – we don't want American capital – to be flowing into Chinese AI companies, helping them win this AI race. And then finally, I'll land on this. Uh, we should insist on basic reciprocity in key areas. We went to Detroit recently to talk to some of the major auto manufacturers. And one thing, they all, they all have different views, but they all agreed on this point that of the 10 autonomous vehicle companies testing in California right now, I think three are Chinese, but our companies aren't allowed the same access to the Chinese market. So it's a matter of basic reciprocity. They shouldn't be allowed in if we're not allowed in the Chinese market. And that's going to be a big deployment of AI technology, as well as a, a data collection platform going forward. Um, let me just ask chat GPT what it is. <laughs> um, I think that um, I have a couple thoughts on this. One is I think what the Biden administration is doing with regard to the export controls that it put in place in October makes a lot of sense. 
in terms of the highest end chips not being exported to China to then be incorporated and trained to do the, the next generation AI models, um, whether it's going to be in military uh, usage or in other surveillance usage. Um, I think that makes a lot of sense, and we're probably going to have to continue to do that, monitor for what are those key pieces of technology that we produce in America that could be exported and then used to further refine AI models uh, and power AI models in China. I think the second thing is we in Congress are going to have to regulate this to some degree. I mean, look, we, at the least, at the least, I hope that Republicans and Democrats can agree that there has to be transparency with regard to AI models. Like, what are the inputs? What, what exactly are the underlying principles that govern the model so that we can understand the outputs? If we don't know uh, uh, about the inputs or the principles that govern the AI model, then um, we're going to have trouble understanding the outputs. And then finally, I think there's a discussion, active discussion. I don't know where it's going to go, but there might be liability associated with the outputs uh, associate, uh, from AI models. Um, and that might be one way that uh, people will be held accountable for the inputs and the principles and the way that they design them. All right, we are going to wrap up on this, which is Washington is a pretty partisan place uh, these days. Uh, divided government, not a lot gets done. We have a Republican and a Democrat here on stage. Both of you really focused on China uh, through the work on the committee. What's going to be the result of that, you know, in terms of what is your expectation of trying to find some compromise and move move something? Sure. Uh, well, first, I just want to say uh, what a what a pleasure it's been to work with Raja uh, on the committee. It's not easy trying to forge bipartisan agreement. We all have leadership dynamics we have to deal with in Congress. We have other committee chairmen and ranking member dynamics. And so I think really the foundation of everything we're doing involves a certain level of trust and, and mutual respect, or at least I respect him. I'm not sure that there's <laughs> reciprocity for that. Uh, I had, I had the same sort of experience working with Angus King on the Cyberspace Solarium Commission, and um, I think as long as you, you have that, um, it, it, you, can, you can find a way forward even amidst some pretty intense disagreements. And listen, there are disagreements not just between the parties on China, but within the parties. And some of the most severe disagreements are, are between sort of more national security-minded people and more financially-minded people. That, that's sort of one of the biggest divides we have right now but uh raja has been uh, been great great to work with so I, my hope is that what we come up with at the end of this year is a series of robust policy endorsements and recommendation that are teed up for actual legislative action in the 118th congress now that means because we have a narrow majority in the 118th congress we're not going to do 100 percent of everything i think is necessary to prevent war in the near term and win the strategic competition over the long term but I think we can make a hell of a dent uh, in that going forward. That means probably we're going to do maybe go a little bit more aggressively than some of my Democratic colleagues want to go. But I, I feel like we can, if nothing else, identify the bipartisan center of gravity on China and then provide a roadmap for how we bring that to life. And then next year in our work, we can go deep in, ter in certain aspects of this competition that are underexplored and tee up action for the next Congress, if that makes sense at all. Mike, we have a no limits partnership, man. <laughs> um, no, I, I, you know, one interesting thing about this committee is that the way in which it was formed. Uh, probably you've, you, you may know this, but the legislation that created this committee got like 365 votes, uh, which, you know, as you know, is very rare. Um, but I remember the first meeting that we had, it was in Kevin McCarthy's conference room, and Speaker McCarthy was sit seated at the head of the table. All of the members of the committee were around it. And seated right next to him was none other than Hakeem Jeffries. That never happens. The, the speaker and the minority leader very rarely, I've only, I only recall it twice happening in my seven years in Congress. But this was one of, the, one of those times. And basically, uh, I remember what Speaker McCarthy said. He said, you know, um, if you uh, are interested in uh, you know, partisan fights and bickering. I've got committees for that. <laughs> but if you want to get something done, this is that committee. And, um, you know, Leader Jeffries and Speaker McCarthy, I think, have created a little bit of a, I don't want to say safe space, because there's no safe spaces in Congress, but a place where uh, first they picked excellent members. Um, 
On my side, I have an incredibly diverse group of people who are very serious and sober-minded. And, and like Mike said, there's a diversity of viewpoints on our side that don't necessarily line up you know, with the way that you thought they would. And I think the same goes on the other side. So we're able to kind of have some very interesting discussions. A lot of times we're in the skiff, we're able to kind of learn together the facts. And then if you can agree on what the common facts are, then there's a chance that you can come to some conclusions, some reasonable conclusions. Mike is doing a great job of trying to find the boldest common denominators that unify us, moving on those, and then, you know, having reports of le legislative recommendations and then trying to move the legislative recommendations. I think we had some success in the NDAA and we, we have to continue to build on that um, as we go forward. The economic piece, as Mike alluded to, is gonna be complicated. There's so many committees, obviously, with jurisdiction, so we're gonna have to you know, juggle a lot of balls. All right, unfortunately, I have a lot more questions, but we are all out of time. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your time today. Thank, Thank you, Anna. Right. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you. That was a great conversation. More jokes and laughs than we normally have uh, in some of these policy conversations. Um, now I would like to welcome Rye Barcott, co-founder and CEO of With Honor Action and Carrie Wibben, president of Exeger Government Solutions for a Fireside Chat. Thank you all so much. Just want to make sure they didn't. All right, well, that's a tough act to follow, but I have no doubt that you are the people for the job. Um, so why don't we get started? Just first of all, kind of introduce yourself and like the vantage point with which you are entering this space so the folks who don't know you personally will kind of understand where you're coming from. Sure What's thing, I'm Ry Barkat, the CEO and co-founder of With Honor. With Honor fights polarization in Congress. We're almost done with it. Uh, and uh, I actually served in the Marine Corps in the same unit as Mike Gallagher. And one of his other Democratic counterparts that he has a true friendship and trust with is Seth Moulton, who I served uh, in the basic school with. And I started the organization five years ago with David Gergen and a number of other veterans. And uh, the organization has helped elect and support a group of 30 veterans in the House who have taken a pledge to serve with integrity, civility, Yes, civility in this town and courage. And of course, you just saw an example of that in our in our panel. And of course, uh, Congressman Mike Gallagher has been a founding member of that. The caucus has passed over 79 pieces of legislation, all bipartisan, focused in national security, national service, getting more Americans to serve and now doing something about our recruiting crisis and veterans affairs. And so we are delighted to be here, partnered with Exeger and having just seen an example of actual bipartisanship, which as Mike and Raj mentioned is really rare in this town in a trusted way. All right, Carrie. All right, thanks so much. Um, what was going through my head is I'm regretting my wardrobe choice because I am clashing with the pink. I should have just called Miss Lord and said, what are you wearing today? She's always on point with the fashion statement of the day. Um, so I'm Carrie Wibben. Uh, I run Exeter's government solutions practice. Uh, that really includes the markets that uh, you would know, know as the US government, uh, international allied partner governments, uh, the defense industrial base, small ecosystem, a couple hundred thousand companies, and uh, critical infrastructure. So the 16 critical infrastructure uh, sectors as defined by DHS CISA. Um, in my past life, uh, not too long ago, uh, I worked very closely with Ms. Lord. I was the head of counterintelligence and security for the Department of Defense for about five years. Uh, much of that time we overlapped in the building in the Pentagon. Um, and I actually ended my tour in the federal government. Prior to that, I was West Point grad, 10 years active duty army officer, and then I, I, I ended my federal service as the deputy director of, I think, the newest defense agency. I don't think there's been another one created, the Defense Counterintelligence and Security Agency. Uh, and it was really in that last five years of my career that I became pretty laser focused on the China fight and everything associated, critical technology protection, supply chain risk management, and really looking to bring advanced technology to the fight. And that's what led me ultimately to leave government and come to Exeter and we'll hopefully talk more about that. Absolutely, yeah. So I want to I want to get right there because we clearly in the previous conversation identified the the threat, right? The congressman talked a lot about China, uh, how the U.S. is trying to kind of figure its way forward. But would love to get your sense, um, Carrie, because they talked a little bit about the private sector and the need for solutions in terms of working together, but also modernizing the national supply chain. 
what are you seeing? What, what, what are, what are some of the challenges? Maybe what are some of the opportunities? Yeah. So I love the question. Um, I think the biggest, I guess, biggest opportunity I see, and I did not see this even a few, few years ago, is that there truly is commercial advanced AI technology that is ready to be deployed at scale at the speed of relevance and can actually make a difference in this in this fight if deployed at scale across government and into the defense industrial base. And we unite those enterprises in a way to fight the fight as if we're all on the same team, right? And so what our technology does here at Exeter, um, our, we have an advanced AI platform that truly does allow us, for the first time ever, most of our defense acquisition programs do not understand their supply chains down to third tier, certainly below, pretty blind. And there's all kinds of reasons for that we don't have time to go into. But what I saw firsthand as the head of counterintelligence for DOD, I was read into every counter espionage investigation that the FBI had open on DOD, most of that related to IP theft from within the DIB. So I can tell you our adversaries are using this technology and have been for quite some time to understand exactly where and how to penetrate our sub-tier supplier ecosystem to get after that one source of intellectual property they need to gain access to, to then gain a competitive advantage over us. And you heard the congressman talk about that. That is their playbook. And they employ multiple threat vectors simultaneously, pretty much unchecked to do just that. Why? Because we have not deployed AI in the same fight to understand our own supply chains and then subsequently ensure that we are very eyes wide open and intentional about what tier we are flowing our intellectual property down to to make sure it's not actually going to the adversary and that we're defending that ecosystem. Carrie, I want to follow up just on something you said and and kind of I think the congressman also talked a little bit about how government, you know, the Pentagon, hundreds of thousands of people, right? often not early adapters, right? You're talking about new technology, you're talking about modernizing a system. Um, one, how, how has it been received? And then what is the kind of, what do you tell people? What is the like, hey, like actually, what you just said is very compelling, huh? No, don't get me wrong. The, the, our adversaries are doing this, but it, has it been a learning curve? Yeah, it's been a learning curve. So um, the Pentagon and really the D Department of Defense, like half the federal government, right? Kind of a big organization. It doesn't move, it doesn't turn on a dime. But when it moves, it's pretty compelling and the rest of the government follows. And it can incentivize the defense industrial base to do the right thing, take ownership of this problem. So we've really seen, and I have to give credit to Ms. Ellen Lord and her former role as Undersecretary of Acquisition and Sustainment, it was really during the COVID response when she partnered with us to bring in our technology to, I would say, Ellen, for the first time ever, I think, do this vetting up front, this due diligence up front to understand in that pandemic response, where was our money going and who were we trusting uh, from, an, from a, a medical supplier standpoint to award contracts to, to help us get the healthcare supplies that we needed, desperately needed to get to the front lines and do that in a way where we knew it was trust trusted, there was not fraud, there was not counterfeit adversarial source supply. And then I think shortly after we did that in about six weeks and we, we uh, helped the Pentagon and the White House avoid over half a half a billion dollars of either adversarial source or counterfeit supply from flowing to the front lines because we did that vetting up front. We knew where the money was going and who was actually running these companies. This concept of betting up front and understanding who we're doing business more broadly in the defense acquisition enterprise sank in pretty quickly. So really since then, we have seen DOD, and this is a relative term, DOD does not move fast, but in terms of what's normal for DOD, it's actually moving pretty quickly. We're seeing the defense acquisition enterprise. You know, I see a lot of our program uh, executive office uh, representatives in the in the crowd here, and I'm sure online, Army, Navy, Air Force, really be brave and take this on and try and just figure out how we do this, how do we implement technology to understand and get visibility in our supply chains, and then use that those pathfinders to inform what does this mean for policy, for DFARS clauses, for the regulatory regime, for the policy regime that Ellen's former organization is now starting to put out? So long, long answer, 
I guess short answer to the to the question is it, we're getting there and we're getting there pretty quickly um, by DOD standards. That is so in three years, a tremendous amount of progress. I'm very encouraged. If, if I could just build on that, Secretary Robert Gates is, is on our advisory board, and one of the lines that he has used repeatedly is that polarization leads to paralysis, and it makes change in any bureaucracy, which is always hard. Every bureaucracy, whether it's the Pentagon, one of the largest bureaucracies in the world, or uh, smaller bureaucracies, are going to resist change. That's what bureaucracies do. It's a natural function. It helps. It helps break through that resistance to actually have a Congress, bo a congressional body that functions and that is bipartisan. And what you heard here was a really big idea, I think, from Mike Gallagher, Congressman Gallagher, that, that Raj uh, agreed with, which is the AI can not only start sussing out our adversaries within these massive uh, supply chains, as Ex Exeger is currently doing, it can also help crack down on the waste uh, and abuse, if not fraud. Uh, hopefully there's not too much fraud. But there is obviously a ton of waste. That's exciting. That's Democratic. That's Republican. We all know it. I was at a breakfast with Senator Joni Ernst, who's worked on this, on cutting it back on waste with Senator Kelly as well. And this is a actual way forward to start to make some real progress on one of the biggest uh, spending uh, organizations that really matters for the country. I want to follow up on that. Obviously, you're an organization focused on bipartisanship. You're a veteran. We kind of heard a lot of the risk uh, that is uh, that is happening right now. When you're on Capitol Hill, what are you hearing from members, or is there still the education process going on when it comes to modernizing the national supply chain? I, I see a lot of enthusiasm around. It. I think the I think what we witnessed here at this event was truly unique and unusual, where you have this level of agreement on the problem and a broad sense of what the solutions can be. That's exciting. We need to, frankly, drive that into other parts of our government, because this is not the only challenge that we face. And it is difficult to maintain this trust. You know, just think about the Ukraine example. I mean, that was one of the most bipartisan efforts. I remember our, the four country caucus of 30 vets within the, the House, the day one after, after the war broke out, they welcomed members of parliament from the Ukrainian parliament, all Republicans, all Democrats. But with that, that support has started to chip away and get, get subject to culture wars, et cetera. So we need to guard this space as sacrosanct and then build on it. And that's part of the reason why With Honor exists, to support those veterans that are there, because the incentives are not aligned. The incentives are to pick your culture war, throw your bomb, um, go raise your small dollars off it, not do the right thing for the country. I want to, we're quickly uh, running out of time, but I want to get to two more questions. And Carrie, I want to start with you. I, I always like to project forward, right? You're talking about kind of what's happening now, the, the progress has been made over the last three years. Project five years out, like how big of an impact can this have to the federal government, to supply chains, to our dependence on China? Yeah, so... Um, AI, it, I think, I mean, I think there's probably general consensus that AI will have a large, play a large part in determining the superpowers of the future. Um, and so, you know, the, the countries, the superpowers that are actually able to, and I think there'll be two, two main fronts that we, we really compete um, on, it's AI and supply chain. And those come together in a, in a very nice, nice way. And if you can figure out that interconnectedness, you know, you heard the congressman mention chat GP, GPT. Um, I, I feel like that is really, you know, captured uh, the public uh, awareness and I think stoked a lot of fear across the labor markets and, 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 and uh, countries globally. And we see governments racing, you know, now to regulate this very rapidly evolving um, pace of technology. And then the, the insight that that technology can deliver into the complexity of our supply chains globally. So um, I think that uh, we're going to continue to see, and we've seen a lot of a lot of legislation. We've seen the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. We've seen the German Supply Chain Due Diligence Act. We've seen National Defense Authorization Act language historically, Section 889, Section 5949, and more that we, we know is coming. We've seen the drop marks for this year's NDAA. Um, and so we, we know that um, the superpowers that actually, uh, and, and by the way, that just drives compliance. Compliance is not the goal. It's not going to get us there. It, it, the goal is resilience. Um, but there's, a I think, a really uh, nice and necessary complement where, you know, the superpowers that really realize the interconnectedness and, and invest in AI supply chain, um, that technology, uh, which again, 
convenient for me to say that because that's what we do. But I truly believe it, and I'd love to talk more about it. Um, I really think that is going to be a big determining factor about you know who actually you know wins in the future and and has dominance at the world stage. Right. How about, I mean, you, I mean, this is right now pretty bipartisan issue, right? We, we don't always see that. Five years out, you're working on these issues, national supply chain and otherwise, uh, you know, are you optimistic? I assume you're, the answer is going to be yes, uh, but, but tell us. Yeah, I, I, am, I am an optimist by nature. One of my favorite quotes is uh, from General, uh, the late General Colin Powell, who said that perpetual optimism is a force multiplier, uh, which is a little bit of military jargon, but basically is a good leadership principle. And we are an optimistic country. We can do this. We can get out of the way. I mean, a lot of these are self-inflicted wounds. <laughs> Let's face it. Right now, a lot of this is self-inflicted. And, uh, and we can, I think, the two congressmen that were on stage today, I think the congressman in the four country caucus, check them out, there are 30 of them. The six senators that we work with, all veterans, bipartisan, they show us a part of the way forward and we're gonna keep at it. All right, we're gonna leave it there on an optimistic note this afternoon. Thank you both so much for joining us on stage for the Fireside Chat. Thank you, a big yeah. thank you to Exeger for working with us and making this conversation possible. I wanna thank all of you for joining us in person and on the live stream. Have a great day and stay safe everybody.